Any questions before we start? Okay, so, so today we're gonna build on what we've done last time with Bayesian learning and, and uh, talk about uh, unsupervised, semi-supervised learning in a probabilistic context, focusing on, on a new algorithm that is gonna, uh, we're gonna call EM. But let's start first with a few uh, administrative issues and reminders. Um, okay, so homework four, as you know, is out. We extended it until next Monday. So hopefully that gave you enough time uh, after the Thanksgiving break. Uh, there is gonna be an overlap with homework five that will be out tomorrow. Officially, uh, we have to make it due uh, next Thursday, which is the last week of the semester. So you only have a week to do it. We are gonna extend it. Um, really, I wanna think about this uh, homework as, as a way for you to prepare for the exam. So most of this homework is devoted to kind of reminding you some of the things that we've done uh, over the semester with a focus on the second part of the semester. So um, there's a few questions that are new that have to do with what we're doing today and, and next week, but most of it is basically uh, a, a refresher for the exam. So uh, next week. I want to remind you that we have three meetings last, next week because Thursday is a Monday schedule and this is going to be our last meeting. Uh, projects, you all know, please check the course website. We get a lot of questions on that, that um, almost all of them are, are being answered by looking at the website. And another reminder on the final, we're going to send uh, a few, another message kind of clarifying things because currently it's scheduled for 9 a.m., which is not going to be the best time for uh, many of you. Um, questions? No questions. Okay, so. Uh, Projects. Okay, just to remind you that today uh, is the is the due date for the progress report. Again, look at the website. All we you need is is a single page describing what you've done so far, what you've read, what you consulted, um, and your plans and problems you have. Okay, you you're very quiet, so I'm hoping everyone can hear me. Um, yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so, so where are we? So, so last week we talked about naive base and basically moved from naive base to logistic regression. So we kind of closed the loop between generative models and uh, if you want probabilistic discriminative learning. So we started with naive base, which you can see here on the left. I'm giving here an example. So this is the classifier that we predict, right? So we want to estimate the priors and we want to estimate the probability of each feature given the label, P of XI given VJ. Uh, and given the assumption, the conditional independence assumption that we've made, we've shown that the prediction is done by the argmax over all labels of this product. And here is an example where I split it to the left side, which is the yes side. The right side is the no side. We have to estimate these probabilities. And then the product in each case is gonna give me um, the value that I wanna argmax in order to make a decision. So from that, we move to try to understand what Naive Base is doing, what is really the underlying hypothesis. And we show that really what it is the decision rule is really a linear function uh, over the features where the weights 
are uh, computed by some probabilities over the data. And we show also that the probability that the label is one in the binary case can be written as this logistic function, one over one plus e to the minus linear sum. And that allows us to, to kind of close the loop and say, okay, let's assume we are taking this functional form. Um, and, but we don't care about the WIs being just fraction of the probabilities. So we don't care about the independence assumption that we are making. Uh, we just want to maximize and find the best WI under this form. Then we move, this algorithm is actually called the logistic regression. We've written it this way. This is our empirical loss directly, what we've derived here. We also had a regularization term and, and we show that this algorithm, first of all, has the same form as many of the other algorithms we looked at before. And in fact, it's very, very similar uh, to the SVM algorithm. Even the loss function is quite similar as we showed. Uh, now, I have here a piece of code that will be made available on the website. Let's see if this works. Um, that uh, gives you some code if you want to play with it. Uh, for the naive base and logistic regression. I'm not going to run it now. Uh, in this case, we're using uh, what is called the IRIS data set. Uh, it's one of the most popular, or used to be one of the most popular data set to, uh, as a showcase for uh, machine learning algorithms. So what you have here is, is a naive base algorithm. In fact, we are running here the Gaussian naive base algorithm which I pointed to in the last few slides in the last lecture. I didn't give all the details, but it's essentially the same algorithm. You can go over these slides. Uh, you can train it. We're showing here some decision boundaries. What I wanna show is not this. You can run it and play with it, but rather the comparison with naive base, between naive base and logistic regression, which I show here. So the red curve is a learning curve for the naive base as a function of the uh, number of example, the, the Gaussian naive base. The green one is the logistic regression. And what you see is a very important property that in fact, naive base is a very good algorithm. And the nice thing about it is that it converges very, very quickly. So at the beginning with very few examples, you can see that naive base is doing quite well. Logistic regression takes a long time uh, to get some reasonable performance, but at the end, logistic regression is, a be is the better algorithm once you use enough examples. Um, and the reason is that it's a lot more expressive. While naive base learns a linear model over the feature space, it doesn't, it cannot express all linear models because the coefficients are limited to be fractions of specific probabilities. We haven't shown this explicitly, but this can be shown. While logistic regression, basically it's, we solve an optimization problem. We try to find the best W uh, and eventually we get uh, a better result. So the code is gonna be there. You can play with it um, and get some better understanding. Question so far. Okay, so, so now that we know naive base, we can move to use it in some uh, broader context. And again, I wanna remind you that we are playing with probability here. This is something that you've seen before and I'm assuming that you all uh, are fluent in it. I wanna remind you the notion of expectation because we're gonna use it a lot today. Again, you've all seen it, uh, here is a dice. What is the expected number of outcome if I toss a die uh, or six-sided die? The definition of expectation is here, basically sum over one to K, in this case six, the probability that I'm gonna get XI times the value XI. In the case of a die, I'm gonna get three and a half. 
And the reason I'm, I'm reminding you that is basically for this property here. Expectation is linear. So if I have two random variables, the expected value of X plus Y is the expected value of X plus the expected value of Y. That's going to be a very important property that we're going to use a lot today. Okay, with that, we can start talking about uh, broadening the scope of the learning algorithm we're talking about. And we're going to talk about semi-supervised learning. So, um, or sometimes even unsupervised learning. So the example that I'm going to use is this classification problem. Uh, it's called the problem of prepositional phrase attachment. So given these two sentences, buy car with money, buy car with will, or wills, uh, the question is, if you look at this preposition, um, it's a different kind of preposition. In one case, it is attached to the verb by, by with something. And in the second case, it's attached to the noun, to the car, car with wheels. Uh, and that's the classification problem. Given a sentence, determine what is the proposition attached to. This really has to do with understanding the sentence. Very easy problem typically for people, not so easy uh, for machine learning algorithms. Um, so, so my label is a noun, I'm going to denote it by N, or a verb. So it's the by with or a car with or a by with. That's the learning problem and uh, many ways to generate features here. Uh, given that I kind of look at very um, simple sentences or I kind of took a lot of the details from the sentence and just stayed with four tokens, verb, noun, preposition, and the object in all cases, uh, you can think about just taking these four features or combination of these four features. Um, but from our perspective, it won't matter. Let's say that we have K features and that's what we're going to run with. So I want to use naive base for this. So I'm going to use naive base algorithm to decide between N and V. And the examples are this, X1 up to XK with a label, which is going to be an N or a V. So let's use naive base. What does that mean? It means that I have two values. I'm reminding you the setting here on the top right. On the left side, I'm going to write my probabilities for N. On the right side, I'm going to write my probabilities for V. And these are the probabilities I need to estimate, right? So I have to estimate the priors, P of V here on this side, and then the probabilities of the features given the, the label. P of X1 given V, X2 given V, P of XK given V. That's it. And remember why these are the probabilities that we have to estimate. We derive this using Bayes rule. So for example, I never ask myself, what is the probability of V given X1? Doesn't matter. Not part of my prediction process. I ask myself, what is the probability of X1 given V? Okay, that's important. Um, now, given an example, the prediction is very simple, right? So I'm multiplying the numbers on the left side and compare them to the product of the numbers on the right side. So P of N given X is going to be proportional to, and you have to make sure we understand why we say proportional to this product, P of N, P of X1 given N up to P of XK given N, and P of V given X is proportional to this product. That's it. So let's take an example. Um, I observe 10 examples. Um, and with this 10 example, I estimated these probabilities. So half of them were noun examples, half of them were V examples, so my priors are 0.5. And then 
this is how I estimated the probabilities of the features, P of X1 given N, P of X2 given N and so on. So now when you give me an example that is one, zero, 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 in this case, K is four, I can compute P of N, Pn of X, PV of X, which is just this product. And you can see from here that clearly I'm going to choose N, right? Pn of X is, is four times larger than PV of X. Okay? Now, it's not always the case that it's such an extreme uh, difference between these. For example, if you try the example 0101, you're going to get 1 over 64 and 9 over 512, which are very, very similar. So in this case, it's a toss up. But you see, I only learned from 10 examples. So what can you expect? I cannot be confident uh, with respect to every input. Okay. Questions on this. Is naive base or the use of naive base here completely clear? Good. So now here is the real question. I had these 10 labeled examples, but I also have a hundred unlabeled examples. How can I use it? Will that help me? So you would like to think that having more data would help, but it came without labels. So just by using naive base, I don't know what to do, right? So, so in order to estimate these probabilities, I need label data. And here I'm giving you a lot of data, a lot more than the label data, but without labels. How can you use it? For example, think about this X here, the one zero zero zero. You kind of know the label of this, right? The label of this is probably N with very high confidence. Yeah, so, so a suggestion here or a comment here is that there must be some kind of learning that will benefit from knowing background uh, prevalence. And that's exactly what I'm looking for, right? So I'm, I'm looking for ideas, your ideas, of how can I use this data, right? So uh, again, as I said, you know, for this example, one, zero, 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 you are pretty sure what the label is. Can you use it as a way to better estimate these probabilities? Right, so, so let's look at this example, right? We have an estimate for its label, right? You're pretty sure it's N. Can you use it to improve your classifier? Why don't I just take this example, label it with N and add it to my labeled examples? Any other suggestions? Clustering based on similarities. So I'm not sure exactly what does that mean? What similarities? So you see, I have only four features. Um, so splitting the examples into two groups, just like this, would be a very, very strong assumption here that may not give us uh, a lot. But I already have a classifier, right? 
I have a classifier here that I estimated based on some example. Why won't I use it? I just want an additional 100 example to help me. I don't want to throw the valuable information in the 10 labeled examples. So what I can do is I can do what I showed here. I can take examples that are unlabeled, these 100 examples, and I can label them using what I have now and perhaps believe these labels, add them to my label set and learn a better classifier. So uh, that's gonna be one option that I'm gonna consider here. So here is an option. We can make predictions and believe them just like we did before, right? So we, we took this example 1000, we predicted it to be an N example. I'm gonna label it with N, add it to my data, and just assume that I have now 11 uh, label data sets. Or maybe I will believe some of them. But if I wanna believe just some of them based on what, how would I decide which examples to believe or which example not to believe? Any suggestion here? How different the probabilities are would be. Okay, so so in the case of one zero zero zero, as I showed, uh, I'm pretty confident because the probability of N is four times larger than this, than the probability for V. In the case of zero one zero one, I'm not confident because it's about a half, right? So they're about the same. Maybe I will not add this example with the V label because I would predict V here uh, to my data set because it's too close to the to a half. So that, that could be a good strategy. So I'm gonna, that goes along with option one, but a better strategy would be to actually use fractional labels. Right, so I can take each example, for example, this one, the 1001, and make, uh, associate with it a fractional label. It's gonna be an N labeled example with this probability, PN of X divided by the sum. So I normalized it to be a probability. And it's gonna be a V labeled example with PV divided by the sum this to sum to one. So I basically split the label to fraction of it is an N label and fraction of it is a V label. You see, when I run naive base, no one says that the labels have to be integers, right? I can do all the computation that we've done with naive base with fractions, right? So I have my, numbers on the left side, the N side. I have my numbers on the right side, the V side. The labels, everything can be computed also with fractional labels. And the, the advantage of this is that for this example, I will gonna have a tilted label. I mean, it's gonna be a lot more N than V, but for the second example I showed you, it's gonna be about a half, so it will not harm me but it will not help a lot. So I can label the data this way. And now the question is, what do I do with these labels? Okay, so I took my 100 examples. I ran my algorithm over this. Uh, and I can label them now. What do I do with it? In fact, what I can do is I can now run it again. I can go again and run the naive base to estimate, again, the most likely parameters, the P of N, the P of V, the P of XI given N, the P of XI given V, using my new label data. Now I have 110 examples. I'm likely to have better estimates. And I can go over this process. Um, and that's gonna be a good way to run an unsupervised uh, or a semi-supervised learning algorithm. So, so let's just uh, 
summarize what we've done. So in fact, we developed a family of algorithms. Um, one of them was user threshold. So, so I'm gonna predict on all the examples that came without labels. Use a threshold that says, if it's above 80%, uh, label it and put it back into your uh, collection of labeled examples. Otherwise, don't use it. And then retrain. So in this case, out of the 100 examples, maybe I will just use 20 on which I could predict confidently, add them to my 10 labeled examples. Now I have 30 labeled examples. I'm gonna learn again, and again, try to make predictions on the rest. And maybe I will find some more confident labels, add them to my training data and iterate. A second option is to use fractional examples. So I'm gonna label the example with a fractional label, probability P of a, for being an N, probability one minus P to be a V, and again, retrain. And there could be other variations of this, but basically uh, this is a solid semi-supervised learning algorithm. And in fact, it's more general than I presented it, right? So um, I can use this for many learning algorithm. In fact, all the linear algorithms that we've learned so far, in fact, produce a confidence measure in the classification, right? They give you a number between zero and one. You can make it a probability. Uh, and the same thing that I've done here for the naive base, you can use with Perceptron, with SVM, uh, with any of your favorite algorithms. So th these are really um, bootstrap algorithms, bootstrapping algorithms. Sometimes it's called self-training. Uh, and uh, they are actually quite useful. There are other types of unsupervised or semi-supervised uh, learning algorithm that I'm not going to discuss. Uh, some are graph-based algorithm, where, as was suggested by one of the comments, you define a notion of similarity between examples, and you propagate labels based on this notion of similarity. So you place all the example in some space with a distance metric. Some of the examples are labeled and you propagate the label to close uh, examples uh, under the assumption that similar examples have similar labels. Um, okay, so that was a very sort of uh, small window into uh, using unlabeled data. But now I wanna push it a little bit further and I wanna ask the question of, I started all this with 10 labeled examples. The advantage was that this gave us um, uh, an initial classifier, right? So we started with a classifier based on these 10 examples and that allowed us to estimate the labels of the unlabeled data and then keep on going. But what if I don't have this 10 example? Instead of the 10 labeled example, I have zero labeled examples. So the procedure that we're gonna do is gonna be actually very similar. I started with 10 labeled examples because hopefully this develops some intuition that if you start with a reasonable predictor, a good guess if you want, you can actually gain some advantage and learn. But that's exactly the procedure we're gonna do when we are uh, dealing with a worse starting point. We're also gonna make a guess. Maybe it's not gonna be as good a guess as the one with 10 labeled examples and continue as we did before. We're gonna make a guess try to label examples, um, use the fractional examples uh, idea, which means that if the example um, is somewhere in the middle, I don't know whether it's an N example or a V example, it's not gonna contribute anything and not gonna hurt me also. But if examples have extreme probabilities, they will actually uh, be influential. 
And this algorithm is going is called the EM algorithm. Uh, EM for expectation maximization, and we'll see as we'll see a little bit later. Uh, so this is really a class of algorithms that is used to estimate probability distribution in the presence of missing attributes. Specifically in this case, we are missing the label, a very important attribute. Uh, now it requires that we make an assumption on the underlying probability distribution, which by the way, we've done also when we just use naive base. Um, and, and the algorithm is going to be sensitive to this assumption, right? Because we are assuming that the data is generated based on some probability distribution. If we are completely off, all our estimates are off. But if we are not off and we are working with the right family of distributions and we are lucky to have chosen a good starting point, a good guess, a good initial guess, we're going to do quite well. Uh, and in fact, this algorithm is known to converge to a local maximum of the maximum likelihood function. So if you restart it multiple times, you're likely to find uh, a good uh, local maximum. Okay, so um, with this, let's start with, with a running example that we're going to take most of our time today and will show us how to run um, this EM algorithm and maybe also the intuition of why it works. So, so let's think about uh, coin tosses. So I'm, I'm going to think about several scenarios. So I have three coins. I'm going to call them zero, one, and two. Uh, the probability of coin zero being ahead is alpha, coin one and two are P and Q respectively. So here are the scenarios that I'm considering. Scenario one, I'm tossing one of the four coins, one of the coins four times. I'm observing uh, HHTH. Which of the coins is more likely to produce this sequence? The alpha, the P, or the Q? True, I didn't tell you what is the value of alpha, P, and Q, but you should you should be able to tell me. Uh, you should be able to to tell me which is more likely as a function of alpha, P, and Q. I'm not sure what does head means as an answer here. What do you think is the bias of coin of this coin that I used here? It's true that it's biased toward heads, but I want a number. What is the most likely value uh, of heads? 0.75, right. So which of alpha P or Q have generated this? Look at alpha P and Q, choose the one that is closest to 0.75. And this is the one that is most likely to have generated this sequence. Okay. Second scenario. Uh, first of all, I'm tossing coin zero. If it's head, I'm tossing coin one four times. Otherwise, I'm tossing coin two. And I'm repeating this. So I'm tossing coin zero. If it's head, I'm tossing coin one four times. Otherwise, I'm tossing coin two four times. And then I'm tossing coin zero again, and so on. So here is what I got uh, when I tossed zero, one, and two. And what I'm showing you here is in red, the coin, the toss coin that I got from zero, and in blue, 
the one that I got from the second one, either one or two. Now you can tell me what is your estimate for alpha? What is your most likely estimate for alpha? Why 60%? Because I tossed coin zero five times and I got H, T, H, H, T, which means out of the five times, three times I got head. So my estimate is 0.6. What is your estimate for Q? Q is the probability, is the bias of coin two. What you're gonna do is you're gonna look at the T labeled examples here because they came, you know that they came from coin two and you're gonna count here. So here I have the same number of H and T's. Here I also have the same number of H and T's. So my estimate for Q is 0.5. Very easy. So what I've done here, if you look at this sequence is I mix two distribution. I mix the coin one distribution with the coin two distribution how do they mix them? I mix them using coin zero. So far, very easy problems. But the interesting problem is scenario three, where I'm doing exactly the same. I'm tossing coin zero. If it's head, I'm tossing coin one four times. Otherwise, I'm tossing coin two four times. However, in this case, I don't show you coin zero. So, I'm basically showing you this sequence, multiple examples, each one of four coin tosses, but I don't know which label they came from. I can still ask the same question. I can ask the question of what is your estimate for alpha? What is your estimate for P? What is your estimate for Q? In this case, coin zero is hidden or latent variable. It's a missing value. And the question is, how do we do this? So really, that's the scenario that we have, right? So we have a coin zero. And as a function of the value I get in coin zero, I'm producing, in this case, four coin tosses. I'm showing three here, uh, based on P or based on Q. But I don't show you what I got here. So the interesting part here is that there is really no known analytical solution to this problem in the general setting. Uh, we don't know how to compute in a closed form the value of the alpha, the P and the Q as a way to maximize the likelihood of the data. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna resort to an iterative algorithm that is called the EM algorithm that actually does this quite well um, if we are really aware of how the data is generated. So let's see, so let's develop some intuition here. So if we knew which of the data points came from coin zero and which came from coin one, there's no problem, right? That, that was our second scenario. Why is there no problem? Because we already know how to do maximum likelihood estimation. We've done that a couple of weeks ago, right? So we said we are assuming that it's a P1 minus P coin. It's binomial distribution. We got M times, uh, uh, we, we tossed it M times, we got K heads. So the probability, and this is the derivation, is going to be K over M. That's the most likely estimate. So that's the easy case. But what if we don't? If we don't have the label here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the following iterative approach. So we're gonna guess the probability that a given data point came from one and two, generate these fictional or fractional labels. We can always do this, right? So if you give me the labels, I can always do the estimation uh, 
and, and find this probability. So now that I have this, I can compute the most likely value of the parameter. The probability of head, probability of tail, the probability, in, in this case, the probability of alpha, P and Q. And once I have this, I can compute the likelihood of the data given the model and keep on going. So basically the process that I'm running is gonna be something like this, right? So if I have labels, I can compute the model parameters. If I have the model parameters, I can compute labels. Now, if I have these or one of these, I can compute the likelihood of the data and I'm gonna to try to maximize the likelihood of the data as a function of the parameters and re-estimate the parameters. And I'm gonna iterate these two processes. Uh, and as, I, as is known, I'm not gonna show this, uh, this process uh, can converge or will converge to the local maximum of the likelihood function and as I said, with a few start, starting it multiple times will give me good estimation. Okay, questions so far before we get to the details. Okay, so as I said, we're gonna assume for a minute that we know the parameters. We know the alpha, P and Q. I'm denoting them as tilde alpha, P and Q, uh, tilde Q, tilde P. Um, once I have these parameters, uh, I can make the prediction of the label, right? Which cone it is. So once we have it, we will use this label, I'm putting this in quote, uh, to estimate the other parameters and so on. So here is my notation. We're gonna have N data points. In each case, I'm gonna have M tosses, HI heads, um, and one minus M minus these tails. And I'm gonna denote the i data point by DI. So now I guess the parameters. I have this alpha tilde, Q tilde, P tilde. What is the probability that this i data point came from coin one? I'm going to denote it by P1 of I, the probability that the i data point came from uh, uh, one or the probability that uh, it's coin one given that I observe this data point. Bayes' rule says the probability that it's coin one, the label, right? The label is coin one given that I observe this data point is the P of D given coin one times P of coin one divided by P of D. And we know how to compute it because we know the parameters, we guess them. So P of coin one is the alpha. The probability of the data given that it's coin one, it's P to the H, one minus P to the M minus H. And this is the probability of the data, right? It's either coin one, left side or it's coin two. So now I have P1I, I have a label. We're gonna call this the expectation step. Now that I have labels, I'm gonna estimate the parameters. What does it mean I'm gonna estimate the parameters? Let's write the likelihood of the data and find the parameters that maximize it just like we did with a single coin. Only that now we have many data points. So I'm gonna do it over all data points. Uh, so we're gonna compute the log likelihood because we said we're gonna, we like to work with logs in this case. So it's the sum over all my data points, log the probability of the data point given the parameters. Uh, now, one of the parameters is hidden. I don't know the coin name. So this data, the I here is, is really missing a value. So I'm gonna marginalize over this value, which means I'm gonna write it this way. So it's the sum over all data points, log 
And here is how I'm writing the probability of di given the parameters. It's the sum over all y's, where y is this label, di comma y now given the parameters. So that's, um, now the problem is that it's not easy to maximize this function. The reason is that I have a sum inside the log, making this, uh, solving this analytically uh, difficult. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna maximize the expected value of the log likelihood over the coin name Y. So the expectation of log likelihood, which is this. Um, now, really what we're gonna do is we're gonna approximate this. And the, next I'm gonna describe how we derive this approximation. So let's start with the, the story. So what is happening here, right? So the value, the variable Y, which is the label of the coin is not observed. So I can not use, uh, I cannot write down the complete data log likelihood. Instead, I'm gonna use the expectation of the complete data log likelihood um, as a way to, to do it. So really what we're doing is we are thinking about this log likelihood as a random variable. It's a random variable that depends on Y, on the label. Uh, and instead of maximizing it, we are maximizing the expectation of this variable relative to the distribution over Y. So let's write this mathematically. Really, that's what I want to do. I want to maximize this expression. We've written this in the previous slide, the sum over all data points, log of this. I can write this as, again, sum log sum over zero one of, I'm decomposing this to be P of Y given the rest times P of D given the parameters. That's always true. Now, once you have this expression, you can notice that this is really an expectation expression. It's the expectation of this guy over this distribution. So I'm gonna write it as the expectation over Y of P of D given P Q alpha. That's really what we want. We don't know how to maximize this. But I'm gonna argue that this one actually uh, can be bounded by, so look, what I have here is the sum of log um, of the expectation. I'm gonna leave the sum here and I'm gonna replace log of the expectation by expectation of the log. So instead of log expectation, I'm arguing log expectation is always greater than the expectation of the log. This is a simple fact that you probably knew that if you have a concave function like this and you take the average of two points, the average is gonna be always below the value of the function, right? So you take the average of these two points, it's gonna be below the function itself if it's concave. If it was convex, it would be the other way around. This is called Jensen inequality. And basically what it says that if I have the log of the expectation, I can always say that it's greater than the expectation average of the log. Simple, and that's what we're gonna do. So now we simplify this expression to be just an expectation of something. We can maximize that. Okay. Uh, once you believe this, I, I need to simplify this expression so I can maximize it. There is a little bit more algebra here, which uh, I'm gonna include here, but not go into the details, but really that's what I want. I wanna write, we've written the expectation of the log likelihood, which is the expectation of this, um, which we've written as the expectation, the, the sum, of all data points, the expectation of this. We can actually split this 
into two components that we can read this way. One of them is the sum for the case where the coin is one. And the other one is for the case where the point is two. Uh, really, there's a little bit more, uh, there's another component here, uh, which doesn't uh, affect the maximization, so I can just eliminate it. Um, it's just a constant, right? It doesn't depend on the parameters, P, Q, and alpha. Only these two parts depend on P, Q, and alpha, so that if I maximize it, I will get the right values of P, Q, and alpha. This one is just constant. I don't care about it. Now, how did I derive from here to these two components? Uh, it's written here. Uh, it's basic probability. I'm not going to go into it because it's going to take 10 minutes to, uh, to go over all of this. But if you're interested, just go over this and convince yourself that what I've written here is correct. Okay, so now let's move back to the algorithm. So what do we have? So we've written the expectation of the log probability. We split it into two parts. One that depends on P1i, the probability that the ith data point came from coin one. Another one that depends on one minus P1i, the probability that the data point came from the second uh, coin, and these I can write down explicitly. So let's write them down explicitly. So what do I have here on the left side? I have P1i. What is this? Is the P1i times the probability that it came, that the ith data point came from one, which is alpha, P to the HI, one minus P to the M minus HI. And in this case, it's the coin two. So it's one minus P1i, the probability that the di data point came from zero, should have been two here. Um, so it's one minus alpha, q to the hi, one minus q to the m minus hi. Everything is fine, except for I should have written two here because the name of the other coin was two. Um, and, and then I can just take the log and write it in a clearer way. So when I'm taking the log of this, what I get P1i is outside here, and I get log alpha, hi log P, m minus hi log one minus P. And the same thing for the second coin, basically with the Qs. And that's it. So now I have an expression for the log likelihood and I can maximize it and find, okay, so what are the most likely values of my parameters? What does it mean to maximize it? It means to differentiate it relative to alpha, P, and Q. So let's look at the case of alpha. It's the easiest one. This is the expression I have, right? It has these two sums here, and I'm gonna maximize it relative to alpha. So see, let, let's see what's, what's happening here. So, these two components disappear, right? I have log alpha, so I'm gonna get one over alpha times this P1i from this part. And from this part, again, these two components will disappear and I'm gonna get minus uh, one over one minus alpha times this, right? So that's the case for alpha, it's very easy. Similarly, you can do it for P and Q and that's what we're gonna get. So let's just verify the alpha. It's the expression that I got. We have a sum over all data point, P1i over alpha minus, from the second part, one minus P1i over one minus alpha. That's the derivative. I wanna make this equal to zero. And it's easy to see that that's what you will get for alpha. So now let's stop here and try to understand what is the estimate that we got for alpha? If you want to express this in words, what would you say? Does it make sense to you that this is the estimate for alpha? So 
So P1i is the probability that the i data point came from the first coin. So essentially, I'm summing the probabilities that it came from the first data point. Let's assume that all the P1i's are extreme, either zero or one. So essentially what's written here is the number of data points that came from one divided by n, which is exactly alpha. Okay, again, take the extreme values. Think about the extreme values, everything is zero or one. So what is written here is basically the number of data points that came from one divided by n, which hopefully you would agree is the right estimate for alpha once we're assuming binomial distribution. And you can convince yourself also that we got the right value for P and Q. Again, start by assuming that the P1i's are zeros on ones. And basically what you will have here is the sum of the number of H's in the one coins divided by the number of one coins, which is exactly what we've done a few slides ago when I ask you, uh, it's still written here on the chat, what is the value of P? What is the value of Q? That's what you've done, right? You essentially counted in the uh, sequences that were labeled one, how many H's you got and divided by the number of coins that were labeled one. So hopefully this estimation makes sense to you. Questions? So really it's a very simple algorithm, very intuitive algorithm, only that we took, we had to use some probability and algebra in order to get there. But let's summarize where we are. Um, and, and as I said, hopefully you are convinced that uh, this makes sense. Another comment is when I did the derivative, I did it relative to alpha, P and Q. The P1, I were already constants, right? I already estimated them in the previous step. They are not part, they don't play a role in the derivative. Okay. Um, so essentially what we've done is given the all parameters, we label the data. The label was this P1i and one minus P1i. Once we have label, we went back to the naive base algorithm if you want and computed the new parameters. In this case, it's the new alpha PQ. Um, and now that we have these, we can keep on going, right? So we can label again uh, and keep on going. So this is the algorithm. We started with what we call the expectation step, right? We guessed some parameters and we computed the P1i, which is the label. Here is how we computed it. Now that we have this P1i, we asked ourselves, okay, so what are the values of the alpha and the P and the Q that generated this data? What is the most likely value of alpha, P and Q that have generated this sequence of data? And we show that we can compute the most likely value of alpha, the most likely value of P, the most likely value of Q here. And that's it. So we finished the round of the algorithm. Now we have new estimates, alpha P Q, we go back to this step. So we iterate this. That's the algorithm. Questions? Okay. Um, I will put some code. Uh, I, I'm not going to have time to show it now, but I will put some code uh, that you'll be able to see along this lecture, and we may revisit it next time. But um, basically, um, here is another rephrasing of the algorithm, right? So we started with some initial set of parameters. In the E step, the expectation step, uh, we use the old value or the guesses if you want, to find the posterior, that is the label. 
And once we have it, uh, we computed the expectation of the log likelihood of the data, uh, maximized it in the M step and derived new set of parameters. So this is written in a little bit more abstract way. I think it's clearer uh, in the concrete case. Okay, so what do we have? So we, we developed EM really a general procedure to learn in the presence of missing vari variables. Uh, we showed how to use it in the case of Bernoulli, a mixture of Bernoullis, right? So we had two coins, each one of them was Bernoulli, and there was a mixing parameters, this alpha, that decided without telling us which coin, which of the distribution, the P distribution or the Q distribution is gonna be generating the data. And we show this as an iterative algorithm. And I show, and I said, without showing that it actually converges to a local maximum of the likelihood function. Um, so um, it's actually a very, very useful algorithm in practice, uh, being used uh, very broadly. Uh, and in fact, what we're gonna show now, um, after we finished with the Bernoulli distribution, we're gonna show another example that many of you are kind of familiar with. And this is gonna be uh, the K-means algorithm. So K-means is really an EM algorithm. K-means is also a clustering algorithm. What do we do here? We are given data points. We assume that these are sampled independently. Uh, and we assume that they are sampled independently from a mixture of K normal distribution in this case, right? So the means of the normal distribution are these mu i's. I'm gonna assume that all of them have the same standard variation sigma. It's gonna make our life a little bit easier. So kind of this is the picture, right? So what you see is these red points. You have no idea where they came from, but someone told you, you know, there are actually two normal distributions here, the mu one one here and the mu two one. And they were sampled from one of these, but I'm not gonna tell you which point came from which. Your job is to cluster them, which means tell me which of the red points belong to the mu one distribution and which of the red points belong to the mu two distribution. Right, so some of you know this as a k-means. What do you do in k-means? Anyone wants to suggest an algorithm? How does it work? If I want to name uh, the point, basically, I want to tell you for each point whether it's a mu one point or a mu two point. You can write something in the chat. You know write your understanding of how k-means work, if you know. I know that some of you are using it, for example, in the project, so hopefully you know how it works. Smaller absolute distance, okay, that's that's a good start. More details. choose K starting points as cluster centers and try to group the points based on absolute distance. Excellent. That's a very good description of the algorithm. So I'm starting with a guess. For each point, I'm guessing which cluster it belongs to, mu1 or mu2 in this case. Uh, and now that I have a cluster, I can estimate its center. Once I have this, I can look again at the points and place them into the closest center. Now I have two new groups. I can estimate their centers. And once I have new centers, I can look again at all the data points 
and place them into the, sun, the cluster based on the closest center and so on. So that's basically what the standard k-means clustering does. It guesses k centers and iteratively it places each point in its center based on distance. Each point chooses the mu one it likes that it's closest to. Once I have now two clusters, all those points that place themselves in mu one and all those points that place themselves in mu two, I'm recomputing the centers. Now I have new centers and I'm repeating. I'm again placing each point based on its um, closest center. So that's the standard k-means and now we're going to develop it and develop a slightly better version of it or a more general version of it as an EM algorithm because basically that's an EM algorithm. We're going to name it uh, at the end. So again, as before, as we did with the coins, we're going to make the notice that if we knew that all the data points uh, uh, are taken from a normal distribution with mean mu, finding the most likely value is easy. What is it? I give you a set of data points. I'm telling you all of them came from a normal distribution with mean mu. What is mu? Can you estimate mu once I'm giving you the data points? It's the average, right? Why is this the average? Same idea as we had before when I asked you the question, I'm tossing a coin, M times, I get K times M, K times heads. And you told me it's K over M, but really the, just, really the justification, it's the most likely value. And that's the justification here too, because in this case, it's a normal distribution. So the probability of X given mu is written with this expression, right? It's some constants, E to the minus X minus mu squared times some constant. We don't change sigma here, so we can just take it with us. Now, I have M data points, and I'm gonna show you that the most likely value of mu is the average. So let's write uh, the log likelihood of the data given mu. Uh, it's basically the sum over all data points of this, right? I'm taking the log of this expression. I'm getting rid of the coefficient. Uh, and I, I just want to, because I just want to maximize this, right? So maximizing the log likelihood is equivalent to minimizing uh, what's inside here which is argmin of the sum over data points of xi minus mu square, right? From here. Let's differentiate this relative to mu. And what you will get, solve it for zero, you will get the mu is the average of the data points. So the intuition is correct. But the complication is that now I don't have one set of data points that all came from the same mean mu, but rather I have a mixture, just like the two coins that I had. So what do I do when I have a mixture? I have to run EM. I basically have to view the mu that governs each one of the data sets uh, as my hidden variable and try to run EM. So, uh, Let's do it, right? So um, same step, same first step as before. I'm assuming that I'm observing X, uh, data point XI. What is the probability that it came from UJ? What is the label or the fractional label that I wanna assign to this point? I'm gonna call this PIJ. It corresponds to the P1I that we had before. It's the probability that it's mu j given that I observed xi. Bayes rule says that it's p of xi given mu j times p of mu j divided by p of xi. In my case, 
I'm uniform over the clusters, the mu j, so it's one over k, times the probability of xi given mu j divided by the sum over all, this is the probability of the data, right? It's um, the one over k disappears here. This is a normal distribution, so I'm writing it this way, divided by the sum over all data points. That's it. So now I have an expression for PIJ. Now I'm introducing a trick that I need to do in order to be able to write things in a more compact way. So essentially I'm introducing new variables, new Boolean variables that I'm gonna call ZI1 up to ZIK, where ZIJ takes two values. One, if XI came from J, from the J distribution, from UJ, zero otherwise. Okay, so it's just a characteristic variable to, uh, to uh, indicate where is this data point coming from. I'm gonna need it in order to write things in a more compact way. So ZIJ is basically kind of like PIJ, right? So the expectation of ZIJ is PIJ because it's a Boolean variable. So it's one, it takes the value one with, the, with this probability, the probability that XI came from UJ. It takes the probability zero if, PI, if XI did not come from UJ. So it's expectation is PIJ. And I'm just reminding you here that expectation is, what is expectation and that it's linear. Now that I have this, I can write the probability of the data point. I'm calling it DI now because I'm augmenting it with the ZIs uh, given H in this way. So the issue is that I don't know where it came from, right? I don't know whether it came from J equal one or J equal two or J equal K. So the fact that I have the ZIK allows me to write this in a compact way. I'm just writing it as a sum over J Zij times xi minus mu j square. So if it came from j, then this one is going to be one, and I'm going to count this in the sum. If it did not come from j, this is going to be zero, so it's going to be disappearing from the sum. So essentially, only one component is going to be here in this sum, which is what I want. I just don't know how to write it because I don't know what which j is it coming from? So that's why we invented the ZIJ, to be zeros on ones um, as we need them. So now that I have this expression, I can compute the likelihood uh, of the observed data and the hypothesis. So it's just like uh, analogous to what we've done before, the probability of the data given the hypothesis, which is the mu, or the log of this probability is just taking log of uh, this expression. I'm taking the expectation of this. We agreed before that we, we don't know how to maximize this. We're gonna maximize the expectation of this. The expectation of this sum can be written as the sum of the expectation. I'm reversing the order. So it's the sum one to M of the expectation. I also took the constant out of the expectation. So, so that's the uh, element I care about, right? So this is the expectation that, uh, of the log likelihood. And that's what I wanna maximize. So basically what I wanna do is I wanna differentiate this relative to mu. Um, so when I differentiate this expression relative to mu, what do I get? I get some constant, sum the expectation of uh, Zij, Xi minus mu j. I wanna equate this to zero. And what you will see is that the estimate for mu j is this, sum over Xi times is the expectation of Zij. Remember that this is basically Pij. Right? The probability that Xi came from the Jth cluster divided by the sum of all the PIJs. 
And again, think whether it makes sense to you. Uh, think about these as just zero, zeros and ones, right? So uh, the extreme cases, and you will see that basically what it says, uh, mu j is the number of data points or the average of the data points that came from the jth uh, uh, cluster, which hopefully makes sense. Okay, so this is just to explain the notation. So um, remember that this is the PAJ, which I estimated at the beginning using my guesses. So I'm denoting this as H prime, kind of the, the previous set of parameters that I had. And as a function of this, I'm esti estimating the new parameters H. So let's summarize, what have we done here? So we started with a set of data points, M data points. We guessed initial parameters. What does it mean? We guessed uh, the mu's. Sigma was uh, also a guess, but fixed. We don't uh, estimate it here. Once we have all these mu's, we computed the PIJ, the probability that the ith data point came from UJ. We also denoted it as the expectation of this Boolean variable, ZIJ, and we computed it this way. Now that we have these PIJs, we know how to compute a new set of means, basically a new centers for the averages, and these are the new centers. And then we repeat this process. Um, okay, so um, one observation is that this algorithm really finds the best K means in the sense of minimizing the sum of square distances to them, because we started with the, this assumption of the normal distribution. But more importantly, I want to recall the standard k-means clustering. What is the difference between what we are doing here and what we have done in the standard k-means clustering? The key difference is that here, uh, we actually believed the centers and we placed each point in a center. While in EM, we place fractional points into clusters. So each point, the ith data point, is placed into all the clusters with the probability PI1, it's placed into cluster one. With the probability PI2, it's placed into cluster two. With the probability PIK, it's placed into cluster K. So essentially I'm splitting the point, I'm splitting the labels as we've done at the beginning today. And I'm saying some part of this point, I believe belongs to this cluster or with this probability, it belongs to this cluster. With this probability, it belongs to this cluster. And with that probability, it belongs to that cluster. So I don't commit to which cluster it belongs to. I'm keeping it fractional with the PIJ as our fractions. So I'm generalizing if you want the standard K-means algorithm. In K-means, I also know these probabilities, but what I'm doing is I'm thresholding them. I'm taking these probabilities, I'm choosing the maximum for each I and I'm saying, okay, so I is gonna be placed in cluster number three because PI three is larger than the other PI J's. This algorithm is sometimes called the hard EM algorithm where we threshold the distribution and keep only the top option as opposed to the general EM algorithm where you always keep your options open, you keep a distribution over the labels. Okay, let me summarize. Uh, we, we talked about EM as a general procedure for learning in the presence of unobserved variables. So uh, if you really go back to the slides, you'll see that the algorithm itself is rather simple and I'm gonna supply some code that you'll kind of see how it works. Very simple because all you have to do is write down these update rules for, in the first case, PQ alpha, in the second case, muse. 
the derivation was a little bit uh, taxing, so go over it and, and make sure that you understand the two steps. Uh, really, uh, it's an iterative algorithm that I promised you will converge to the local maximum of the likelihood function. Thus, it might require many restarts. Uh, but once you make good assumptions here, once you make good assumption with respect to the family of probability distribution, it's actually very, very good learning algorithms. If you don't make the right assumption, it could fail. I'm gonna discuss a case like this uh, next time. Um, and as an application, we derived k-means, which is a very important clustering algorithm. If you want the most important clustering algorithm that really we showed it as an EM algorithm. Questions before we're done? Okay, so um, in fact, you know, I'm gonna ask you a question before we're done. So something to take with you. I'm giving you a learning scenario here. The learning scenario has examples of n plus one dimensionality, x zero up to xn. And your task is to predict the value of x zero, given the assignment to all the n variables. I want you to think about how to model this as a learning problem. Specifically, I want you to realize that there are multiple ways to model this as a learning problem. You can model it as a discriminative learning problem. You can model it as a probabilistic, a Bayesian learning problem. And I want you to think about both options and we're gonna revisit this uh, next time. With that, uh, we're done. Have a good rest of the week and we'll see you next week.